All right, Saints fans, inside black and gold, Steve Geller along with Jeff Nowak on a postseason edition, but not quite playoffs for the Saints finishing the year we know, 7-10. and 10. The hot talk of the offseason really hasn't been too much surrounding uh, players right now, Jeff. It's been all about head coaches, former head coaches, and assistants. It's the off season. Yay. <laughs> um, yes, yes. So that's what today's episode is going to be about. It's going to be all about the coaching. We're not really going to be really talking about players so much as where is Sean Payton going to land and what is he looking at? What are some Saints assistant coaches looking at in terms of getting interviews and why are they able to interview for their job at all based on the NFL rules? We'll get into that. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's going to be a question of what can the saints get back for Sean Payton? So we're going to get into that as well. But the first things first is, is yes. I have been trying to just not talk about Sean Payton over the last several weeks of the season. Cause I'm just exhausted about it. Like it feels like we've been talking about it every week, every episode we've mentioned Sean Payton, Sean Payton, Sean Payton, Sean Payton. Now we have to talk about it because this is the part of the season where we find out if the saints actually get anything for him. And there was a question all year of how many teams would be involved in, in potentially wanting him, right? Like that was always up in the air of like, we think that we know what other teams see the value of in Sean Payton, but that was always kind of a guess, right? Like there's the meme out how, how like, Oh, he has the same credentials as Mike McCarthy and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, do other teams think that? Or do other teams kind of see the value of bringing in a Sean Payton and, and thus would be willing to shell out assets and to worsen their own incoming assets to bring in Sean Payton? Now, I think we have a pretty clear answer because there are already four teams that are planning to interview Sean Payton, and that is the Houston Texans, who apparently have already done it, the right. Denver Broncos, the Arizona Cardinals, and the Carolina Panthers. And that seems like it's going to be it. We, you might get the Chargers in there, but it would be really out of character for that for that franchise. We'll we'll find out. Um, but yeah, so I mean, these teams would not be interviewing Sean Payton if they weren't seriously considering trading for him. And so that's already a win for the Saints, in my opinion. Yeah, and the Chargers seem to have made you know some decisions with their offensive coordinators and another assistant coach over there. Yeah. So it seems like Staley is pretty safe, surprisingly, I guess, because that it seemed, I think, to all Saints fans, too, like a perfect fit, obviously, of Sean getting to go out west, coach with that young gun quarterback, and obviously out of the AFC, too. The the biggest one for me on this Saints list, I guess you could say for the for Sean Payton, also the assistant coach, um, defensive coordinator, is you're looking at the Carolina Panthers looking to become – uh, possibly your next, you know, a la Saints franchise. You know, I could see them trying to make a, a ginormous move like this, even though I would have to imagine that the the asking price to stay within the division's got to be more for for Sean, huh? Yeah, yeah, and and I'm not sure that it's worth it for a team that doesn't have a quarterback and doesn't have a pick that's like in like. Like the Texans, for example, you can sell. And we're going to get more into the Texans, but like you could sell it as like, yeah, we don't have a quarterback, but we do have a pick where you can go get a quarterback. Absolutely, the, the right. Panthers have not the nine. So like maybe you can get a quarterback. That, <laughs> like you can get a quarterback, but it's, you don't guarantee you get the one that you want. And Sean's not going to be able to know if that's the case. So it's like you are like that's a that's a lot. Anyway, well, we can we can get into that, but. Um, yeah, it's – I kind of lost my train of thought there. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the Chargers, I don't think that you would go the route of firing your offensive coordinator and doing all that and then firing the head coach because – Big swoop you would do it in. Well, I mean, firing the head coach would basically mean you're firing the offensive coordinator. Like, you you wouldn't do it in reverse because why would you just – why would you just accept – unnecessary violence <laughs> just to do it anyway right like so if the if the saints hot fire dennis allen you would assume that his staff is going with him like that's what the panthers did with steve with the with 
Matt Rule, and then so you, obviously you get rid of the coordinators and blah blah blah, and that's why the Panthers have an open defensive coordinator position right now. Um, but it, it is strange, and the only concern I have with the Chargers not firing Brandon Staley if they don't is that if that really is the one place Sean wants. And he's like, you know what? I'll wait because I have a feeling one more year of this and they will be ready to fire Brandon Staley. And none of these other teams just make like really, really just make him want to get back into coaching. And he waits another year because, and Sean said this, and it's definitely true. If he sits out another year, compensation will go down. Like it will, because when you're talking about a head coach and this was some confusion on this front, when you're talking about a head coach's contract, it's not like a player contract. Correct, right. So like if a player sits out and doesn't get accrued time, the contract does not val- like validate that year as being under that contract. That's not true of head coaches from what I understand. So like he could potentially just stay out for two more years and then just come back and sign somewhere else. So the Saints know that <laughs> other teams know that Sean knows that. So he has a lot more control in these uh in this kind of negotiation than I think a lot of people realize because he has the poison pill (laughs) at any point. So like people are like, well, why the saints can play hardball. They can hold out. It's like, no, they can't because a Sean gets to decide whether he comes back to coach or not. And B Sean has to live with the assets that remain once he gets there. (laughs) So don't, don't fool yourself into thinking that, it's just the team trading and the and the Saints kind of coming up with the with the number. Like Sean, if he wants to go to the Cardinals and he's like, I'm not going there unless they have the number three pick, the Cardinals aren't gonna trade the number three pick. So like it's that is a part of it. Well, the thing too, which you know, you start to look at for Sean's choices right now what's really the most attractive for you as a head coach? Do you want to try and salvage things with Kyler Murray? Do you think that Russell Wilson just had a really down year there in Denver and you can still um, kind of work with him and get him back to being Mr. Unlimited that he thinks he is? Uh, In Houston, you have the opportunity, obviously, to you bring in a vet and also likely draft your – "Quote unquote quarterback of the future," and then yeah, Carolina is really a mixed bag. Is this, does he does he try and work with Sam Darnold? Um, I think that would still be an ex, you know something on the table, but I would think you Sean's still going to want to go after a quarterback as well. There, uh, the the one that I'm really perplexed with the Chargers not pulling the trigger with Staley after. Such a terrible loss, obviously, in the playoffs. We, you know, you you saw that just completely collapse. And you would think with Sean Payton on the market, knowing how it seems to be like it, all the, the stars seem to be lining up there of where he wanted to go coach in a situation with a young top quarterback that you know is more established than somebody that would be coming in. And Sean getting to be out on the West Coast and the, the the organization of the Chargers really needing some kind of a, a voice of direction, of some kind of leadership that Sean also provides. It's more than just the head coach. It's also the man. And I think you know that too. It's just his whole, that Sean Payton persona he brings somewhere. Yeah, right. Well, I think like you can look around the NFL and you can see examples of why, you know, teams should be willing to shell out to bring him in. Um, you look at the Giants, right? Like, this is a team that was rudderless. Virtually the same roster. Like, it, nothing has really changed. Same quarterback, same running back, same same general field on defense, less playmakers on offense. And suddenly, hey, they're in the divisional round of the playoffs. And it's like, well, what's the difference? Well, you bring in Brian Dable, who is able to kind of turn on Daniel Jones to the, the to what he needs to be. And suddenly... This is a team that's not only playing well, it's playing fundamentally sound. It's not making stupid mistakes. They're, 
like the Giants won that game. They went to Minnesota and they beat a, ga- a team that probably didn't deserve to be 13 and four, not only because they played well, but because they played pretty much a perfect game of football in a, at a moment when they needed to play a perfect game of football. And you look at other teams that, that, that question the coach and the coaching staff, and you're like, yeah, this team is constantly making mistakes. They look stupid. They, they look they look like they don't understand what they're doing, right? You have an opportunity to run for a first down, and you go out one yard short. I get it. Your knee's blowing up, but it can't happen, right? You can't have all these penalties. You can't have all these turnovers. You can't fail to force turnovers. Um, and so it's like, yeah, that does. it's like hard to say, oh, well, oh, the head coach is this, and the head coach is that. But there is a culture element that – you can instill and you can easily find when you're talking about a good head coaching regime. And that's not always the same though, right? Like you look up at, at new England right now and you're like, okay, we know the head coach is good. Like no one's questioning whether Bill Belichick is a head coach. So why is this team struggling? Why is this team missed the playoffs two years in a row? Right? So yeah, you have to kind of actually, I don't know if they missed the two years in a row. I can't remember if they snuck in last year, but um, you know, it's not always just a, a one hit fix. But if you're a team that feels like you have all of the pieces and you are just not getting to that point, I don't know why you wouldn't make that, make that, um, make, pull that trigger. And, but this is the Chargers, right? Like this is the Chargers. So we shouldn't be surprised. Um, it just seemed like too good of a situation for everyone right now. Is, is it really going to change much going into next year, except you've just wasted another, season of justin herbert possibly right no i i agree, I agree with that you're preaching to the choir right i, I get it. it it's just but, odd to me I, the whole situation yeah. with the chargers i mean it's 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 you can say it's odd but it is on brand right like this isn't <laughs> this isn't something that should be unexpected for the chargers and we are on the opposite side of that where we are trying to say well why wouldn't they do that right and they are on the side of it saying why would we like we are trying to find reasons not to disrupt everything that we have and fix things. It's very similar to what the Saints are doing right now, right? Could you, like, could you I, ever imagine Sean Payton handing Boza his helmet and then Boza slamming the helmet again on the, on the turf? It just no. seemed, seemed to me a lack of respect for the coach right there, right off the bat. Maybe you read too much into things. I don't know. No, I mean, I, I agree with you, um, but... Let's so we don't need to sit here and talk about the charges. Let's talk about the kind of so I guess the question for me is like, okay, so those are the four teams that that we have, right? And so I think everyone was under the assumption that Sean Payton couldn't interview until like today or tomorrow. I thought that too. The Texans came out and tweeted, Hey, we interviewed <laughs> Sean night. Payton, which is weird in and of itself. I don't know, you know, like usually it's reported. So and so interviewed John Payton. It's it's like it's weird that a team would would post that for clout. Um, because like, what if he says, "I don't want to p- coach for you," and then they're like, "Oh, but we talk to you." Does that make us anyway strange? And then they they put out a whole another tweet too with all his alcohol, uh, his you know his career achievements kind of thing. Yeah, it, it's a strange organization. <laughs> I don't quite understand it. Um, it's like but, all right, cool, yeah. cool. So, you interviewed him. Yeah, and and. and I, and the thing is, like, the schedule for when you could interview was always kind of up in the air. And I don't know whether they jumped the gun or whether the the initial dates that people had put out there were inaccurate. Who cares, really? It doesn't really change anything. Um, but it's Denver Tuesday, Carolina Thursday, right? Yeah, the other, the other team should kind of be start, like, lining up throughout the course of this week and maybe next week. And the question is, are those the all of the teams, right? The Colts have reportedly called the saints and maybe like asked for like, okay, what are you looking for? Blah, blah, blah. But they didn't, add, they didn't get moved on to the interview phase, which based on what Mickey Loomis said is because they didn't ask because when he, when Mickey Loomis was asked whether any teams have been declined, he said, quote unquote, not yet, which is his fun new way of not answering your questions. Uh, Cause he also said, have, have any front office staff been, been asked to interview for GM? He said, not yet. So cool. Um, but it does mean that like the Colts didn't get declined. They just didn't ask. He didn't indicate whether if they did ask, they would be accept- they would be moved along. I don't know why they wouldn't be, but it's I think that's a good indicator of like, okay, 
we don't anticipate any more teams being included here. I, you know, Mike McCarthy was the other name that you could say, well, if his team lays an egg in the playoffs, he might get fired, but they obviously did not do that. They blew out the Bucks and did it in very, very impressive fashion outside of the extra points, <laughs> which Brett Maher, I don't know what the hell's wrong with him. It's like he was still playing for, and I couldn't have been still playing for the Saints because if he was playing for the Saints, they wouldn't want to make those kicks. I have never, ever, ever seen a guy miss four consecutive extra points. I don't think it's ever happened. And the crazy thing is they sent him out there for a fifth, and he made it. <laughs> yeah. At no point was it like, you know what, maybe that two-point conversion is looking good. Yeah. At some point, it's not his fault. It's your fault. It's like it's like when Brian – like I think Brian Kelly said something like this earlier in the season. It's kind of like old coaching trope. It's like, it's like I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at me for putting you on the field. <laughs> it's my right. fault. <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah they kept putting him out there but it was funny because there was a point there was a point that the that the the game was not over and the the cowboys had a chance to kick a like a 35 yard field goal and instead they went for it on fourth and four and they scored a touchdown on that play and it's funny to me because if they did not get a first down there and they turned it over he would have effectively cost them a touchdown Yeah, I mean, because he missed four extra points, and then they four they went they skipped a field goal, and then if you turn it over there, that's on the kicker because they the only reason you didn't kick it was because you didn't trust him, and so like that would have been a touch it down in a game where maybe the the Bucks come back and make it interesting, and then all of a sudden you're like, wow, uh, this guy needs to be put on like suicide watch because like Jesus, I I've never seen it anyway. Moving on, we don't need to do that, but like Mike McCarthy's not going to get fired after that performance. Um, no. They're going to have to go play on a short week against the 49ers, which I think is ridiculous just so the, the NFL can have a Monday night game. I'm so glad that their cash grab game was unwatchable because what a stupid thing. Like the, 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 in a playoff game between two teams that didn't get buys, the Cowboys now have to go on the road and face a 49ers team that played on Saturday. Yeah, we're lucky this the Saints aren't involved in this because it'd be a huge NFL. Oh, I'd be conspiracy. so annoyed if that was the Saints. Yeah, I, like the Saints wouldn't have beat the Cowboys, but <laughs> no, I think That's what we created at halftime. I was like, this sucks. It should be the Saints losing eighteen to nothing right now. Yeah, and I think with um, what we saw with the Saints too much was the fact that the you know they had moments where they looked like a contender, but for the most part couldn't execute on that level consistently. Yeah. And so, and that's kind of what, what, what Sean said. And that's a good point is like when he was talking to Colin Cowherd and he was saying like, you know, like a lot of teams that are looking for a head coach, they're not going to be a good situation. Like you don't fire your head coach because things are going well. You fire them because things are going badly. And that's why the charges were kind of a unique situation because it was like, oh, this team, this is a team that things are going reasonably well for. And so if there is an opening, you can jump in and just be like, right, straight up. Um, and the same thing could be said for maybe the Cowboys, but it doesn't look like either of those are going to come available. So the next question is like, okay, who is your next best option? And again, as I said, Sean Payton is going to be able to drive this process to, to the team that he wants. And so then the Saints are going to basically set a level of compensation and say, if you meet this, you can trade for him and then go from there, right? This isn't going to be a hardball situation um, because of the, because of what we talked about before. And so what Colin, Colin asked Sean about, about the Texans specifically, and here's what he had to say. I think I know the ownership group, not re very well, but we practiced against the Texans okay. in New Orleans four or five different times. So um, Cal McNair, his, his late father, um, we'd, we'd see them. And so I don't, I don't know them well, but I, but I know them. We've, we've, you know, when you, when you practice for three days with an opponent, you, you get a chance to meet a lot of the different personalities and people involved in the building. Um, they've got really good draft capital, really good draft couple capital. Good, couple good young players. They're in a division that you can at least look at and say, all right, Indy, Tennessee, Jacksonville is nothing, but you, you can at least, all right, how do we, so I, I think there's, growth potential immediately there from their two or three wins that they had this year. Um, 
I know Nick a little bit, Casario, mm-hmm. um, because again, when he was in New England, we had a lot of practices with with their team. So each each team would be just like we're having that discussion. There'd be pros and that that's the significance though of the upcoming week or two of meeting mm-hmm. some of these individuals, asking some questions, maybe some difficult questions, and 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 trying to get answers so that we're not having difficult questions when you've already taken the job yeah and so i think one of the questions is well will sean go somewhere where they don't have an established franchise quarterback and only two teams on this list of teams i want to interview him can say they do and that's the broncos with russell wilson and the cardinals with kyler murray neither of those players is like a slam dunk yes this is a quarterback that you would bend over backwards to try to coach um, Kyler Murray's coming off a season ending injury. He really likes to play call of duty. And I, I just don't know if, if he's an NFL quarterback, Russ is had the worst season of his career. <laughs> um, he's on the wrong side of 30. The, he, you know, he's, he's weird. Um, uh, it, like, it, I, I don't know. So it seemed to, and I know it's not really fair either. The fact that a ton of negative stories just seem to pile up about his attitude and demeanor over his time in Seattle, of course, on the oh, way out. Russ. Yeah. And well, it, it's it, true of Russ and Kyler. They're very similar in that regard. They're both short. You know, <laughs> they're very similar quarterbacks in the in the sense that, like, you know, you have to tailor an offense around the fact that they can't see over the, the line. And, you know, if you had to have a coach to come in who understands how to do that, it's Sean, right? So, like, I get it. It makes sense. But at the same time, if you didn't have to do that, and this is what I've said before, is if you are looking for a immediate title window where you might win a Super Bowl in the next three years and have a really good chance to do it, it would be one of those teams, right? Where, but but after that, you're talking about a hard rebuild, at least with the with the Broncos, definitely. The Cardinals, eh, it's a little tougher, but like if you are looking for a situation where you might have a decade long run of sustained success then it's probably Houston, right? And so that's why they're, when they're I... They're a nice clean slate, kind of. You know what I mean? And yeah, Sean even right. mentioned the, clean slate, all the ton assets of draft they have. Assets. Right. And, and like you're going to be able to basically create the staff that you want. There's no bad habits because no one's around to have them because you're cleaning house. They already got rid of that weird chaplain guy. Um, and yeah, so like it's if I'm the Saints and I am hearing Sean go out there and basically talk himself, basically sell the Texans to himself, I'm I'm on all for it, and I'm I'm Mickey saying good idea, Sean. Let's let's see. Let me know how the interview goes, uh, because that's the place I want him to land. And we can get into more of the competition in the next segment. But I, I think that that's a significant thing to hear him say, and it's it's interesting to have him be so transparent about this process, um, because I I don't think the Saints would be this transparent. No, and I wonder is that like part of his gig because he's with Fox that you know Colin gets him to sit down with him so easily because it just seems it is, yeah. Yeah, it seems off Sean character to even be discussing this right now. He's not a coach right now. I think he's I almost feel like he's been out of the coaching sphere long enough that he's that his filter is is off to an extent, right? And so he's in analysis mode. And he's not even thinking about like the competitive balance of what he's saying. He's just talking. And that's why you're getting these very candid interview responses that you would not get from the saints from the texans right but he's not in he's not involved with either of them so he can just say whatever he wants and the second he gets hired to a job that that like mask is going to come right back on (laughs) you're not going to get anything from him (laughs) but besides the whole back with the texans too and them bragging about their interview why why even put that out there kind of thing i mean it does it doesn't it seems like you're definitely helping the Saints out, you know, and making Sean look even more attractive than he already is as the asset, as a as a coach, a leader, a guy that you talk about with a Super Bowl window that you obviously open immediately by bringing him in. I don't know. The, you got to understand, the Texans don't have a lot of good things going for them. <laughs> this is the best thing that's happened to them in like three seasons. Is is Sean agreeing to come talk to them? So they're excited. They're excited. No, for- 
considering what happened, obviously, with Deshaun Watson and and yeah. like, and just in general, it would be an amazing like you talk about wiping the slate the slate clean. It'd be am- amazing for them if you're just bringing in a guy like Sean Payton, drafting you know a top quarterback in the NFL draft, and just restarting really anew. Considering what you had just you, I'm sure the organization went through a lot of hell. Yeah, like I think the Texans are a team that wants to st- like if the Texans were the only team involved, they wouldn't be making this trade today. And if the if they were if he was a free agent, they would be going harder than anyone to sign him. Like he, they're the one team that I look at that like there's no question whether they would give up the assets to right. go bring right. Like the only question is whether Sean would choose them. Exactly. And so that's why you put out that post because you, you want Sean to see it and you want your fans to see it and start retweeting and say, please bring in Sean. We want Sean. We want Sean. So that Sean sees it. And then Sean's like, Oh, they love me. They really love me. <laughs> and, and so that's why you're doing it, right? It's not a competitive balance thing. They are, they are very much putting their cards on the table and it's just a question of whether Sean picks them. So that's what I think is going on there. But okay, let's funny if it ends up being Houston over Dallas kind of thing. Yeah. In yeah. the end. Right. Okay, so let's let's cut that off there. And we're going to come back in segment two. We're going to have a quick segment on what is the type of conversation they could get. Sean, again, give a very candid response on this. Um, and, uh, it, and it very much sounds like he's driving that discussion. Uh, so stick around on Inside Black and Gold. And we're back here on Inside Black and Gold. And the reason we have to talk about this first is because if we don't talk about it, then we're not going to have anything to talk about afterward. That's going to be compensation. I'm Jeff Nowak alongside Steve Geller. And as we were talking about, Sean Payton going to get traded, hopefully, this offseason. And if he does, the Saints are going to get something back. The question is, what is it? And Steve, you know, what What would you want to see? Like, what would be, like, like everything else aside, take all the teams off the table, just in a theoretical Sean Payton trade, what return would you want to see coming back to the Saints? Uh, obviously, a first-round pick this year, I think, is number one overall. Obviously, since the Saints don't have one of theirs either, um, if if they did, you know, had one come into this draft, maybe you think about the possibility of multiple future first rounders if you want to start considering that. But I think getting one for this upcoming draft is pretty vital. And then for me, I I don't think you're going to get that m- uh, multiple first round picks in the deal uh you'd be lucky to get another second rounder I think, uh, along with the first for me uh you're more maybe a first and a third and i don't know what else you could be maybe looking at it some uh later compensation but for me i take like a, a first round pick and a, a like a number two next year i'd ask for kind of thing Okay, so here's what Mickey Loomis had to say on that topic. No, we haven't settled on exactly what the comp- compensation is going to be yet, but they're well aware that there's going to be uh, compensation. They're aware of what you would... Look, the reason I'm being a, a little bit coy about this is that it's going to be different for every team because they have different picks and they have yeah. different things available to them. And, and uh, so but it's, it's not firm it's with... You have to get our permission to d- have a discussion with him, and then they have to have um, we have to have the compensation settled before they can actually make an offer or hiring. Yeah, so I think that that's that's an important note here. Is none of these teams have agreed to say, okay, we will trade you this if we decide to hire Sean Payton and he comes and co- coaches for us, right? All four teams, so that's the Broncos, the Texans, the Cardinals, and the Panthers, have agreed to trade for him. Like they they understand that there will be compensation, but it's not a situation where they're like, well, it's going to take at least a first round pick. It's going to take this, this, this. So that kind of makes it interesting, right? Because you are then allowing Sean to dictate where he wants to go. And I think that's the right approach because, like Mickey said, it is a situation where there are different assets for everybody. And this is what Sean had to say when Colin asked him in a very similar kind of answer, but it's very, very descriptive. 
I think each team um, would be a little different. Mickey Loomis and I have talked already about it. I, I think ultimately the compensation f- for the Saints would be uh, a mid a mid or later first round pick. Okay. Um, now we can arrive at that in a lot of different ways. Uh, I think Denver has a pick they acquired back when they traded. Uh, it's the 49ers uh, Chubb. pick. Yeah. So they have okay, that. Okay. You're right. So it's the end of first pick. round. You're right. Yeah. But, but each team's got different ammo yeah. or different pick selections. And, you know, it, it could be a future one maybe where you have to throw in something. Um, I, I say this because I know Mickey well, and I heard him talk the other day and, and he was right on. And I think I am too. Um, he, he's got a job to do as a general yeah, manager right. with the Saints, uh, and, and he'll, he'll get the right compensation, and, and I'm sure the team, if it gets that far, uh, will arrive at it. And it's probably this year, it would probably be, you know, a mid to late first-round pick, I, I would say. So, yeah, and, and I think that's that's something, when you say mid to late first-round pick, right? He said that, what, four times in that answer? And it's like, that's not something that he just started saying today. That's probably what when Mickey and the teams who wanted to interview Sean had a conversation, they said, yeah, what about what, what's, what would it take to get yeah, probably a mid to late first round pick. Right. And they're like, yeah, okay. I think we could, I think that makes sense. Let's let me talk to Sean. And, and so there you have kind of that, that iteration, but not every team has kind of the same assets as, as he said. Right. And so when you're talking about a mid to late, late first round pick you're really talking about the value of a mid to late first round pick right so you you know every team works off these trades or these like pick value charts and so you look at like okay what's the value of the 16 which would be the very middle of the first round right and then you say okay well you're not getting the three you're not getting the two right you're not getting the nine probably but how can we kind of match that value right what if the cardinals said hey we'll give you the 34 because they're because the they're, there's actually everyone who picks after the Dolphins actually has their next pick moved up one because the Dolphins lost their pick. Um, so what if he gave you the 34 in the next year's second? Would that about balance it out, right? Because you're not going to get the 34 in the next year's first, but you're also not going to get this year's first unless you want to give up maybe your own second. So like it's not about okay, well we definitely have to get exactly a mid to late first round pick. But you have to match that value. So like the Texans, for example, when we talk about why the Texans would be a great landing spot, it's partially because it would make sense for Sean Payton, but it's also because the 12 this year feels like, to me, the ceiling of what the Saints might be able to get in a trade for Sean Payton. At least like in terms of peak draft selection area. They might be able to get a bit more value if like maybe they said, hey, Arizona, like you don't have to give us that first, but we want like two seconds and a third. You know, would you prefer to have that over the 12 this year? I don't know, but I would want the 12 this year because I want to save face for that trade I made last year. Right. So that's kind of where you have that balance sheet, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, to me, I, I could see a possibility of maybe being able to sneak away with that ninth overall pick from Carolina. If the Panthers are really hot and heavy, seriously involved for Sean, want them that bad. But the problem is, you know, you, you've also got to pay still Sean's salary, obviously, off, after all that. So giving up that high, man, that's tough. Yeah, to give up that high of a pick and then have to turn around and pay him. 17, well, you know, 18, 20 million a year. Well, you have to pay him and you also have to sell him on a vision of why he wants to be there, right? And so you're talking about, it's like, yeah, we'll, we're going to trade the nine for you. But then you don't have a first rounder, right? right? And you don't have a quarterback. So like, unless they said, hey, we're going to trade the nine for you and then we're going to drop a bag on Lamar Jackson's head. I don't see how it would make sense because you don't have a quarterback and you don't really have the assets to go get one. And you know, maybe Tom Brady goes there, right? Maybe that's how you sell it. But I don't think Tom Brady wants to go live in North Carolina. Do you? <laughs> um, it, it's, I, I don't know. That's, that's tough for me, but again, they do have two second rounders, right? Because of the Christian McCaffrey trade. Um, the Broncos, for example, have the 49ers first rounder, which is going to be late first. Right. It might be 31. Um, because again, there's no 32, <laughs> uh, 
then they have two thirds, right? So would you, again, here's another example. Would you prefer, and I'll just ask you this. Would you prefer the the 112, the number 12 overall, or the 49ers pick and two third rounders this year? Like what would you, what would you prefer? Say, if, say the 49ers pick 30th. And you get either 12 overall or 12 overall or 31. 29 and then 29. two third rounders. Yeah, I'm gonna take I'm gonna take the extra third round picks. What about 29 and one third rounder? Uh for the Saints, man, it's tough. I I would be happy with getting another fairly high draft pick, honestly. Right. So that's what that's kind of what I'm trying to figure out. Unless, like, unless there was somebody that high on the draft board they were in love with, obviously. Yeah, sure. Like maybe, maybe there's a quarterback that you can go get, but um that, I don't know. That, I, I don't know around 12. I, I'm I think the Saints should be in asset collection mode. Yeah. More so than than bit, splash pick mode, in my opinion. No, I definitely agree of, of trying to you know gain as many uh as much ammunition as Sean put and put it in there with Colin Cowherd. And we've seen this team hit on, on a number of spots in the draft before. And it, it's, they, they need a kind of infusion of young talent. Uh, they need to hit big in, in a, in a draft class to help move things along here right now, especially everyone keeps talking about them being in salary cap. Hell, obviously the best way to, to fuel your roster is with young manageable contracts. That's, that's a no brainer. Yeah, and and I and I think whenever you don't have a quarterback, you should be in asset collection mode. And the Saints very much don't have a quarterback right now, because um, that's the difference to me. Like, if you have the quarterback, if you have a Justin Herbert, if you have a Joe Burrow, if you have a Josh Allen, if you have any of the <laughs> heck, even Daniel Jones. Like, if you had a Daniel Jones where you felt like, hey, this is a guy who we can win with, yeah. then that twelve becomes way more valuable than the third, than the than the twenty nine and the third, because you might be one piece away. In this case. You 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 may you could be all but one piece away, but if you don't have that quarterback, you probably can't win. And obviously, the 49ers are proving that they're an exception to that because Brock Purdy was literally the last pick in this draft, hmm. and he's proving to be—I don't know if he's good, but he's good enough, doing a good enough job to win playoff games. And I can name you a whole lot of quarterback like like you have Trent Dilfer, right? Like you can win with that guy, but. You have to you have to be in asset collection mode, and your roster has to be incredible up and down to win that way. And so that's why you want to like that's why the extra third would be more valuable than maybe picking twelve with the difference you can get from twelve to twenty nine. Now, what I will say is that the Saints have seemed have struggled to pick at the latter half of the first round. Right. Like that's it's not somewhere that they have proven to be able to draft particularly well. That they draft really well in the second round, in the third round, in the fourth round. They seem to be able to find hidden gems. But whenever they end up picking in the 20s, since maybe Cam Jordan, right? Like Cam Jordan and Mark Ingram are exceptions back in 2011. You know, you end up with a Stefan Anthony or, yeah. you know, Peyton Turner, Marcus Davenport. You know, I think Marcus Davenport was actually 18, but um, it's. It, 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 it's their track record for picks in the second half of the first round have not been great. Is kind of where I'm going with. No, I mean, yeah, it's kind of odd to think that you you look at their later round selections <laughs> have hit a lot more. Uh, what was Rankins? He was a first rounder. He was, yeah, he was probably mid, so not even really late. Okay, I think he was the twelfth overall pick. Caesar Ruiz, twenty four. Peyton Turner, twenty eight. Um, Davenport was 14, so he's tough to include. Ramchek was 32. That was a good one. Rankins was 12. Stefan Anthony was 31. Brandon Cooks was 20. Kenny Vaccaro was 15. Oof. Then Cam Jordan, Mark Ingram, 24, 28. Patrick Robinson was 32. So, yeah. Robert Meacham was 27. So, I mean, like, that. but then you have, like, okay, Chris Olave was, was 11. Um, Marshawn. Marshawn was 11. Sheldon Rankins was 12. Andres Pete, you can complain all you want about him. He has been a serviceable guard in the NFL for a decade. Um, 
not a decade, eight years. He was 13. <laughs> and I mean, his issue has always been health, right? Kenny Vaccaro was 15. So I like Malcolm Jenkins was 14. So I think like, if you want to look at it this way, I trust the Saints to make a high quality selection at 12, a little bit more than I trust them to make a high quality selection at 28, 29, because I think this team gets a little too caught up in traits at that point of the draft. And then you end up with guys who, you know, from a mental makeup perspective might not, might not be where they need to be. And you take guys from small schools that, that, that are all potential and then they don't pan out. And, um, and that's a struggle, I think. Um, so I don't know. I, I still would like the 12, even without the quarterback, even the, even though the argument I just made would seem to indicate that I would prefer the late first rounder and the, and the extra picks. I want the 12. I want, I want Sean in Houston, get him out of the NFC. And I want the saints to pick number 12. That'd be an ideal scenario. Like I said, it's also funny. The fact that you think, Oh, the Dallas Cowboys were constantly always mentioned as that landing spot for Sean and where he wanted to be. And just to go to Houston organization would be another satisfying kick to the Cowboys rear end. <laughs> I know. And so like, there's a few other teams, like obviously we mentioned the Texans. So they have, they have this number two overall and then number 12, and then they have a second rounder, two thirds, and they have two firsts next year. So how about, how about this as a scenario? The 2023 second from the Texans, which would be 33 overall, and then the Texans first next year. That seems a little steep, huh? Would it be? How about, how about the Browns first? Yeah, just two two first for Sean seems a little steep for me. No, it's not a first. It's the it's the thirty the third number thirty three. So they're keeping two and twelve. Okay, keeping two and twelve. Yeah. So that's the difference. They're not giving up twelve, but they are giving up the number the second pick in the second round and next and year's first. Next year's first. All right, you're playing a little gambling there. Well, that's what that's what I'm, I mean. That's what the Saints did, right? Like that's what the Saints did and gambling that. Next year's first wasn't going to be that high. Um, wow, and wow. So do you think that Sean Payton coming in to a weak division can keep you out of the top 10? Can, can get you better than 12? I don't know. Look at what Doug Peterson did, you know? Right. So, you know, I think that's kind of a, that's kind of a question, right? It's like it's the same gamble the Saints took this year when they traded for the 19. And they said, well, yeah, but what about, would that extra first help us win the division? Which it almost did. Um, well, I don't think the extra first did, but they almost won the division. <laughs> um, and cause Trevor Penning didn't play really. Uh, so I don't know. That's another one, but I think I, like, that's why this, this conversation is really interesting because it's, it's like, you can't just say, well, you're going to give us this. We're going to approximate this. Then we're going to come up with, with a number. But I do think when you look at the Texans, they can give you a lot of interesting options. Whereas the Cardinals, for example, they have the number three overall pick. Great but then they don't have any extra picks to play around with. Like every pick they're trading means that they are not making a pick this year. Like the car, the Texans can trade the 12 and still pick number two. The Cardinals can trade the three and then not pick until the second round. And then they have a third, a fourth and a sixth. That's it. So like they can't give you their extra second, you know, like they don't have it. So like, yeah, you probably, the best pick you're going to get from them this year is going to be the 34. And so wh where do you go from there without the Cardinals giving up a significant number of assets because they only have their picks. They have all of their picks, but they only have, I'm sorry, they have all but their sixth round pick next year. So like, will the Cardinals give you the 34 in the, their future first? Probably not. Right. Cause that's their only future first. The, the Texans have two next year. The, the quarterback situation in Arizona for me and the lack of quote unquote ammunit draft ammo really isn't attractive at all. Uh, with, I agree. With the Arizona I, I Cardinals. don't, and you're lose, You're also losing DeAndre Hopkins. Yeah, and JJ <laughs> Watt retired, right? Like, right. I, I don't like everyone's trying to sell me on the Cardinals, and I get it because I know that that Sean Payton really likes Kyler Murray. I just don't know everything else around that, right? Like, I I don't see it, and I I don't know if Arizona is an NFL fan base that really gets me excited, you know, like. <laughs> 
um it's hot but it's not fun you know it's a desert you know it's not like it's not like I guess like it's southern West california for sean that's what people yeah. are thinking maybe yeah i guess but um yeah like that 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 market does not excite me in that sense but like like again like the broncos yeah they have some interesting even even though they made the trade for russ they still have some interesting assets the chargers the chargers are very similar to the bengals in that they have all of their original picks. You know, like they don't do stuff like this. And that's why when you're talking about why would they keep Brandon Staley, it's because that's what they do, right? They run it back. They do this kind of thing. Um, same thing with the Bengals. Like that, they were always that team that was just like, yeah, we're just going to, we're going to see how it goes. <laughs> um, yeah, this, the Cincinnati situation is, is crazy how things have worked out there for them. Um, but that's what happens when you get a top tier quarterback, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's and that's why you look at it and you're like, why would the why would the Chargers stick with Brandon Staley when we've seen that you know all it takes is the quarterback and then the right pieces around him? And you you I don't see like you have the star running back, you have the star receivers, you have a decent offensive line, not a great but a decent offensive line. The defense is solid, can't win. And no, I keep him. I can't believe you know like I know that I said like well this makes sense. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> But they're going to do it because they're the Chargers and they got a charge. It it just it's wild to me considering the fact that you have this, you have the be all end all gift that's on the market. I, 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 granted, it is a very expensive package you have to pay for to get Sean Payton services, but it just seems like the most obvious and perfect fit there for location and talent, quarterback. Uh, and, and an organization in desperate need of some kind of nuts, you know, some kind of swag, whatever you want to say it is that Sean Payton brings as the, the man, the person, along with his football know-how just seems too perfect. And they're like, now nah, we're going to we're going to stick with this kid and, and not, not for nothing against Brandon Staley. But when you look at what he brings to the table compared to Sean Payton, there's no freaking difference. Yeah, the the only the only argument I'll make for it is you, you would basically be handcuffing yourself to Sean saying, "Yes, I want to be there." Because you can't do it beforehand. He's under contract. So, if they tried to back channel and said, "Hey, Sean, would you come here if we fired Brandon Staley?" and they got caught doing it, Right. then they wouldn't have a first round pick to trade because the NFL would take it away. It's like it did to the dolphins. Right. So like, um, you know, that's tough. So you're basically have to go on faith that we're going to fire our head coach. who We think maybe, okay, he can figure this out. We think but we're not sure, but we think we have to fire him and then say, well, there's four of the teams that are interviewing Sean. Hopefully he picks us. And then if he does not then what are you going to do? Right? Like then you've just fired your head coach with no backup plan. So, I think that does, you know, like there is a there is risk there, and I understand it because we're kind of like going into this saying, well, if they fired Brandon Staley, Sean Payton would be inserted immediately as their next head coach, and I don't know if that's true. It might be true, but like we're all guessing, and Sean can't come out and say it. They can't come out and say it. So I think that might be playing a role here in in making it a little more difficult. But I agree with you. Like honestly, I think it's more about what they would have to pay Sean, not what they would have. To pay the Saints in compensation for Sean, maybe. Which is crazy to me if that's the case, because like we're talking about billionaires here. Like, get the hell out of here. Yeah, but I <laughs> like, guess you, you know, making Sean possibly the first twenty million dollar a year coach, it's it's but pretty who cares? absurd. Like, how, I mean, this this is a billion dollar organization. It makes no sense to me anyway. But that that's like, the thing though too. You mentioned the Chargers going to be Chargers. They've they've never been that that team to, to go up and swing for the grand slam kind of thing. And so that, that, that part makes sense. Yeah. That's why they never hit a grand slam. <laughs> they got, they got Khalil Mack though. They did get Khalil Mack. Yeah. But all right. That, I think that we kind of went through that. And I think, I think we laid out, you know, a decent number of like the interesting scenarios that could occur here and why, you know, these, there's a lot that the Saints can pull out of this if they do it the right way. And that's why, you're not trying to play hardball with Sean. You're not trying to play hardball with other teams. You are trying to maximize your return. Like that's the important thing. Is you're not you're not trying to you're not trying to hold people's feet to the fire. You're not trying to make them angry at you to the point where they're like, "You know what? I don't want to do this anymore. It's not worth it. We're going to ride it out." It's 
what's the most you can get where everyone who has the ability to screw you over does not feel like they're inclined to do so? Because everyone in this discussion, every team that's negotiating, at the Saints, Sean Payton, Mickey Loomis, everyone has the ability to screw one party or more over in this, in this situation. And why wouldn't you do that? Well, one reason you wouldn't is knowing that that other team didn't do it to you. And, and I think that's part of this, right? Like I have people saying like, well, if the, if the, if the Cardinals are willing to give up the three and the Texans won't give up the two, and then Sean wants to go to the Texans and it's no, it's not how this is going to work. This is a much more amicable situation than that. <laughs> what I could see as an issue though, is what if Sean is like, I don't like anybody. I'm going to wait. And that just, that hurts. Right. Exactly. And huh. then you're, then you're talking about nothing. You know, maybe next year, who knows what's going to come open, right. right? Maybe it's only the chargers. And so they have all the leverage and all you end up getting is like a fourth rounder. Right. <laughs> oh, so <God>. like, <laughs> that's why you're not, you, you know, you're Mickey Loomis and you are working with Sean. You are working with these other teams because it's an asset and you just want to make sure that by the time you sell it, it's worth something. And, and that's the biggest thing. Yeah. And, and I think fans have probably finally come to the realization that, Sean's not coming back. It's it's they're going to go forward with Dennis Allen and the the magical dream of Sean coming back to New Orleans and taking over at, after a year off is not going to be the case. The funny thing is this discussion we're having about Brandon Staley is the same discussion other people are having about the Saints. Like I can't believe they're bringing that guy back. Anyway, um, <laughs> I guess touche, right? <laughs> but all right, let's wrap that up and we could talk about the two assistant coaches who are getting interviewed in other locations and why one of the weird decisions of last off season is the reason it's happening. Um, stick around on inside black and gold. All right. Come back for one more segment on inside black and gold. I don't think that's how you say segment in other languages, but I'm going to go with it. <clears throat> Sounded very foreign. Um, Jeff Nowak, Jeff underscore Nowak on Twitter, and Steve Geller over there at Steve Geller WWL. Check it out. Check us out at WWL.com. Latest content, all that sports talk, 4 to 8 p.m. Uh, on WWL AM 870, FM 105.3, and always for free on the Odyssey app. Just like this podcast, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Leave us a rating. Leave us a review. We're doing this because we love you. It's kidding. I don't know you, um, but it's fine. All right. So speaking of people that we love, Chris Richard and Ryan Nielsen, some of our best friends on this uh, on this franchise, and that's not true, but we do talk to them a lot um, as media members. Like the, and the reason that is is you know coordinators are made available, or at least this year they were made available once a week on Thursdays. We would talk to Pete Carmichael, and then we would talk to one of <laughs> Ryan Nielsen or Chris Richard. They got to split that duty, and that was the probably one of the few perks of their <laughs> kind of strange co-defensive coordinator situation where Dennis Allen was effectively the defensive coordinator. He called the plays. And then you had two guys who were effectively position coaches but called defensive coordinator. And so they kind of split that duty, and neither of them had the responsibility. They never got held to the fire, although Ryan Nielsen did get fined $50,000 for being Cam Jordan's coach on those fake injury things, which the Saints are appealing this week, so we'll, we'll kind of find out how that goes. Um, and so it kind of, you know, we talked to Dennis Allen about it and it was like, well, you know, I think it worked out pretty well. Like we might run this back next year, but one of the things that comes up when you have this co-defensive coordinator situation is that getting hired into a full defensive coordinator role would technically be a promotion. Hmm. And that's relevant because coaches that are under contract if they, if other teams want to interview them for what would be considered a lateral move, so for example, your linebackers coach going to interview for the Broncos linebackers coach job, the Saints could block that, right? They can't in this situation. And so the Falcons are currently, or the Falcons have requested to interview Ryan Nielsen for their defensive coordinator position because Dean Pease, if you remember Dean Pease, the guy who got run over by Rashid Shahid prior to that week 15 game, has retired. He said he didn't retire because of that, but it probably <laughs> didn't help. Um, and then the Panthers, who still don't have a head coach, <laughs> are have requested to interview 
Chris Bouchard, which I don't know if I've ever seen a defensive coordinator hired before a head coach, which is odd in and of itself, but it might be a situation where if we hire Sean Payton, would you be interested in being our head and our defensive coordinator? That right? definitely feels so, like that for sure. Yeah. Or maybe they are going to try to keep Steve Wilkes on. And and Steve Wilkes said, hey, I like Chris Richard, right? So maybe that's what's going on. But like the, only, the reason that can happen, and the Saints can't do anything about it, is because neither of those coaches are in the defensive coordinator role. And I think when you look back at it and you say, man, this is really inconvenient, it's like, man, maybe we shouldn't have done this. Because I don't see who it benefited. You just didn't want either one to leave. But you eventually, you effectively made it so both of them could leave. This year. Yeah, you know what? That was something that I was a question going into the year. Obviously, how is that all going to unfold with Dennis and essentially two more defensive coordinators? You had like a triangle of defensive coordinator input coming in. Was there going to be any kind of, you know, regression? And I think that the defense was pretty on par all season except for some late game situations that we've talked about, obviously. But for the most part, I think that the defense got better as the year went all along also. And um, the secondary in, in particular got better as the season went along. And I was going to say, if there was a problem, though, all year, definitely I would say along the defensive line, um, either finding that complementary defensive end or even in the middle at defensive tackle seemed to be your your biggest sore spots with the, with the unit as a whole. Yeah. And a lot of the players who got brought in were, were, were Ryan Nielsen guys, right? Like Contavious street was an Absolutely. NC state guy, yeah. Ryan Nielsen. So like he built that line in his own vision. So he gets held accountable for it. Um, I don't, I, you know, I'm not blaming him for Marcus Davenport. I think Marcus Davenport is a very unique situation. I don't think his mental makeup just really works, but, um, and, and that's kind of where you are. But I will say that, you know, all that said, if you asked me, so obviously they're co-defensive coordinators. They're on the same line. But if you asked me who was second in command to Dennis Allen in terms of the defense, I would say Ryan Nielsen in part because he's been there longer. But second, because in the preseason, when you when when they were kind of deciding who their backup play caller was, they went with Ryan. Um, and, and he's also just kind of always spoken with more authority about the defense as a whole. And, you know, I, Chris Richard is kind of a platitudes guy. I've said this before, not platypus, platitudes. Um, and it's like you ask him a question, he's going to give you kind of the cliched answer of like this. And like, I like Chris Richard. I think he's really, really sharp. And he does give you like, like very, very authoritative answers. I but appreciate it. I never felt like I was getting that on. Yeah, I never felt like I was getting the truth out of him. It was more like it's like this is the rah rah the rah rah information, but I like I need just kind of like exes like I don't I don't need to get fired up right now. And I'm sure you could fire me up. I'm sure you could do it, Chris. But I need you to just tell me the the information. And I, I never I didn't always feel like you were getting that um, from him. And and you know I don't know maybe that does resonate in the locker room better than it, than it does to the media. So I'm not going to pretend that I know what's going on in there. But if 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 I'm the Saints. And I have to pick between one of those two coordinators. I I, I think they would lean to Ryan Nielsen. Um, and but, but at the longer. same time, if he wants to go to the Falcons because they're going to make him, you know, Arthur Smith is an offensive guy, right? So if he wants to go to the Falcons because they're going to basically make him the rock star of that defense, maybe they don't have a chance at Ryan Nielsen because I don't think Dennis Allen is going to give up play calling on the defensive side. That's a great point there. Why not? have a chance to go wherever it is and make a name for yourself instead of still riding as basically Dennis Allen's, you know, assistant. If you, you know, you're still going to look at him as it's not Ryan Nielsen. It's not Chris Richard's defense. It's still going to be Dennis Allen's defense when he is the head coach. Right. It's the, it's the same issue that you, that Eric B has run into every year. Yeah, of, exactly. You right. know, it's like, are you just in a product of Andy Reid? Because you don't call the plays, right? And so, you know, if if you're if you're a guy who wants to be a head coach, and you're sitting there like like the Pete Carmichael to Sean Payton, right? Has Pete Carmichael ever been really given credit for all these offenses? No. When it's good, it goes the credit goes to Sean Payton, or at right. least you know it had when you know obviously they were a duo, right? And right. so that's the same thing, right? With if you're the Saints could have the best offense in the in the NFL. I'm sorry, the Saints could have the best defense in the NFL. 
DA is going to get the credit for that. It's not going to be Ryan Nielsen. So if I'm a guy who wants to be a head coach someday and my, the way I can stand out is by leaving and going to be in charge of a defense where I will never get that opportunity on this staff, you know, I, I might do it. And because, and the only reason that he's able to do that is because you kind of went this weird half ham half ham route. I just made that word up of of not really giving him a job that that he probably has worked for and deserved. Um, and so I, I don't know. Like I think that's gonna you know like people are gonna give the Saints grief for not firing Pete Carmichael fast enough. Which yeah. is like get out of here. Like I don't. I, I think that's so dumb. And um, I feel like I feel like that pressure seems to be growing just because of all the open offensive coordinator jobs that are now open. Yeah, but if they fired him today, they would be on par with all of those people. Like, oh, exactly he, right. He, the, the, like the thing is, like once until the playoffs kind of get going, you don't even know what that picture is going to look like. And so, what what benefit do you have of like not talking? Like, anyway, we can get into that a little bit more. But like, I think when you look back, you know, the decision to not really hire a defensive coordinator last year, it could be what burns them this year. Because what happens if if Sean Payton does want Chris Bouchard as his defensive coordinator. Yeah. And Chris Bouchard can now effectively go wherever he wants because it would be a promotion. And then Ryan Nielsen says, you know what? I like the Falcons situation better. I'm going to go, I'm going to go be the defensive coordinator for the Falcons so I can be the defensive play caller. And then you effectively lose both of your potential defensive coordinators because you wouldn't give either one the job. Well, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, it's, that's tough because then it's like too. Do you, are you gonna? Is then it's gonna turn to somebody in house, which what I would imagine would be the case. Who want, who are you gonna bring in from outside to be your quote unquote DC when everybody knows it is the head coach? Yeah, no, I I think you'll be able to retain one of them. I would be surprised if you can retain both in that co in the co role. I think you're gonna have to make a decision on one. Sure, right, and. Again, it's it's interesting because I would I would probably say like could never Ryan Nielsen would be the pick, but I would also say that Ryan Nielsen is most likely to leave because I don't think the Panthers are going to be able to sign Chris Richard. But he, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if Chris Richard gets interviewed by by other teams. He's been a defensive coordinator before, and he's been a good one. Like he was he was the secondary coach for the Legion of Boom, right? Like that Seattle defense that was like revered around the NFL for so many years. That was him. He was the defensive coordinator for at least the the tail end of it. And he was the secondary coach for a majority of it. So, like, like he's got some cachet around this league. And so, who knows? But I, I do think that it's – when you when you look back on it, I think the Saints will regret doing that. Because it's not a situation – you want to know who your staff is. Like, like, now they are in a position where people are saying, well, why haven't they fired Pete Carmichael yet? Well, they're trying to evaluate because they want to figure out not only – what they have in P. Carmichael. And even if they've already kind of resigned themselves to the fact that he's going to be, they're going to move on from him. He's got staff under him, right? So what are you doing? At, like wide receivers coach. What about the offensive assistants? What about this and that? Like he's the guy who knows all the information he's been working with them. So he's part of that evaluation process. If you fire him, then you're effectively saying, well, we're going to make this, we're going to figure this out for ourselves. And that doesn't make sense either. So like there is a benefit to doing it amicably and to doing it thoughtfully. And that's what the Saints are doing. Like I had, I had someone tweeted me this morning with the quote tweeted like, "Oh, the the pan, the Bucks fired Todd Bowles, the Bucks fired Byron Leftwich that like twelve hours after they lost to the playoffs." And he was, he was like, "This is how you do it." And I was like, "Oh yes, the Bucks, the model franchise that we should all aspire to." Get out of here! Like people are gonna tell me that the Bucks are doing it the right way. The Bucks basically handed Tom Brady the keys to the plane. Tom Brady flew it straight up in the air, and he's about to jump out with a parachute. And everyone's going to try to tell you, well, the people that have been the back in the back, the passengers, are they can fly that plane? Like they cannot fly that plane. It's going to be a disaster. And congratulations, you had three, you had one really good season, one eh, season, and one bad season that ended up in the playoffs in a blowout. And now you are you are going to crash and burn, and you're going to be bad for a long freaking time. And so, like, that's not this example of a model franchise. That's the example of a franchise that's just like going where the wind blows them. And, and the Saints aren't doing that. And so I'm not going to blame a team for doing that. No, and you know, the general reaction from everybody is obviously for everything. It seems to be fire them, move on, cancel, whatever you want to say. Uh, but 
yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure if these defensive moves could affect even w- – would you want to keep a coach like Carmichael around just because there is that quote-unquote continuity of somebody that's familiar with the Saints' way of doing things. If you end up losing both um, – you know, Richard too. and and Nielsen. So it just there's a lot of things that still obviously we're waiting for t- to unfold. It's just amazing of how much interest in the NFC South. I mean, do we see do we see the Buccaneers get involved at all in this Sean Payton, you know, experiment? Do you think that could be a possibility? Would be interesting to see if they would want to target Sean at all. But no, I mean Brady's leaving, so that maybe not over there. And again, again, if you were going to fire Todd Bowles, I think you would have just done that because then it's like you're just cleaning house anyway. It's very similar yeah, to right. the Chargers. That's true. I don't think you would go the route of – like you're, you're not asking for unnecessary unpleasantness. If you were going to fire the head coach, you wouldn't have already fired the offensive coordinator unless like there was something crazy going on, which who knows? Maybe there was. It sounds like they were ready to fire Byron Leftwich midseason. And again, and it's another example of like – one of the reasons the Saints can be thoughtful and take their time is because it's not a toxic situation. Right. Which I'm pretty sure you could say it probably was for the for the Bucks, right? Sure like, like you it, don't right. fire your offensive coordinator Immediately. hours after the season ends right. and say, like, oh, it was fine until like 8 p.m. last night, and then it all went to shit. No, the writing has been on the wall there for a while. And he knows that. The players know that. The other coaches know that. The front office knows that. And so, like, the ability to just say, hey, guys, let's take a breath. Let's come back next week, and we're going to work it all out. People say that's lazy. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> lazy is the other way. <laughs> you want the Doing quick more fix. work is not lazy. <laughs> I don't know. It's just stupid. The, People just like to complain. It does feel like, though, that I, I think you it, it, would, it would appear that the Saints would – make a change at offensive coordinator. I'm not saying that Carmichael is safe. I guess f- folks are just wanting the hatchet already, you know, to come down kind of thing, uh, to, to reassure them that we're not going to go through the same offensive pain next year. Yes, I think that's <laughs> what it is. It's like people are are equating not doing it immediately with not doing it at all. Yeah. Now, if they got to the off, if they, if they decided to keep them, then I would be just as critical as everybody else. But I'm not going to be, I'm not going to, you know, jump over a barrel to to be like, how dare they not fire this guy instantly? Like, he's been on the he's been on the team for 17 years. You don't think this is maybe an emotional situation for everyone involved? Like, I mean, come on. Um, and so like again, like I think they will move on from him, but who knows? He didn't. I don't think he really wanted to be the offensive coordinator at all. Maybe he does want to stick around in a different role. It right? never felt like that way either. Pete so, like, just, there's, there's he unfortunately there's, had to talk to us every week. Yeah, he didn't want to. <laughs> there was no co offensive coordinator. <laughs> I assure you, he dreaded that every time he was walking out there. Like, God damn, I have to do it again. I never have to do this one. Like, he would go se- entire seasons without talking to us. Absolutely. <laughs> Like he Absolutely. would talk to us like one time in during training camp, and then that's it. And the draft, <laughs> and, and that was it. No difficult questions. The offense could have been terrible, and no one would have ever, no one would ever mentioned his name. Oh, a dream job, right? No, to me, the the biggest one this year, and I think we all felt bad for him. Thursday in London, you know what you call it? Uh, Jameis Winston supposed to practice. That, of course, is the day that Dennis Allen does not speak. So yeah. Carmichael's just left there dangling at the podium all by himself trying to explain the thing. Yeah, poor guy. Never had a chance. That's why you get the big bucks. Yeah. But all right, yeah, so that's I think that's going to wrap it up for us on this episode, which, you know, like, yeah, the big questions right now looming out there. Who Who's going to really go, in all, go all in on Sean Payton? Yeah. What's the actual compensation going to be? And then past that, what's going to happen with the defensive coordinators who are interviewing elsewhere and what's going to happen at offensive coordinator where you're still evaluating and people are, are mad about it. Like we're not, those are the questions. And stuff. this is a coaching staff that needs to kind of figure it out. And I think that the only mistake you can make right now is 
pretending that everything was okay because it wasn't. And so uh, that's that's what I'd like to see. And hopefully over the next few days, we'll get answers on that one way or the other. And I, I like the fact, too, that they are not being rushed into things no matter – I don't feel like there's there's pressure on them from anybody, honestly. It's just maybe perception from fans thinking that the, the front office is not doing anything to make changes. Yeah, like they just don't care. Right. They're just – they're just uh, playing Call of Duty with Kyler Murray. I don't know. I mean, maybe they are. Maybe that's how. Maybe that's how Mickey. We. I, I don't know much about Mickey's. Uh, Mickey's. You know, home life. I, I but maybe that's how he gamer. decompresses. Is he? He. He blows up some heads on Call of Duty. I could see maybe Mickey doing paintball. I don't know about Call of Duty. You're right. Mickey seems more like a Sims guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he makes he actually has like a like a Sims like you know NFL where <laughs> that's how he kind of he goes through his well what if we did this? Oh okay, yeah, well the sim the sim's pooping on the floor. He's not happy. Um anyway. All right. I think that's a good place to end this. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks y'all for listening to Inside Black and Gold. Come back next for the next episode. We're gonna we're, go through a lot of free agency pooping stuff. On the floor. Pooping on the floor. Well, if you don't give him a bathroom, that's where they poop. Anyway, same as a cat. All right. Thanks, y'all. Be easy. No poop.